I've played quite a few MSX games, especially during my Konami Conquest, as they put out tons of software for the PC in tandem with what they were doing with the Famicom Disk System, or in some cases, the arcade. But as always, with any format you play video games on, there's going to be good ones and there's going to be bad ones, and the topic of today's episode are 10 more MSX games that you should avoid. Games that would make me rather have Roseanne Barr sing the national anthem into my ear through a megaphone while I'm trying to sleep. These aren't the worst games, but they certainly weren't fun to me. Let's begin. Oh boy, Penguin Adventure. So I loved the first game in this series, Antarctic Adventure. It was a simple, endless runner kind of game where we dodged projectiles, the camera was behind us, and it was a challenging time. I actually really enjoyed it. Our sole objective was to run across Antarctica to get some dank penguin vagoo Get laid, if you will. In some ways, it was the start of that genre as well. Then we have Penguin Adventure, which tried to be better. And who better to do it than Hideo Kojima? This was his first game ever at Konami. The problem I have with Penguin Adventure is that in combination with what made Antarctic Adventure fun, we have something that Konami did as a trope that infuriates me to this day hidden areas that are mandatory for progression. So imagine you're playing this game as if you were playing Antarctic Adventure, just controlling the penguin moving forward, and then things start magically looping, and you're like, what's going on here? So instead of the game suggesting, hey, look for a hidden area, it makes you waste tons of time trying to find the hidden area, which is tied to holes that traditionally we dodge. We jump over because we're on a time pressure, right? Usually these holes impact your ability to complete the level, right? It's stupid. Trust me. Play the first one, skip this one. <laughs> ER Kung Fu is a game I talk about often because it's very hit or miss for me. Sometimes I enjoy it, sometimes I don't. And in the case of the MSX release, I don't. And it's 100% tied to the capabilities of the MSX for sprite motion. The hitboxes are a sight to behold, the enemies will annihilate you, and in some cases I think it's akin to playing a Tiger electronic game, right? If the graphics were somewhat sufferable. The biggest thing that pissed me off were the controls, and what they intended to do with the game in the arcade, it didn't translate well to the MSX. However, the music did, so good on the sound engineers in that department. If you're gonna play Yi'ar Kung Fu, trust me, just play the arcade game, because the ported versions, they really aren't up to snuff. The MSX, or at least early games on the MSX, they suffered from one major issue that seems to have a direct impact on the ability of programmers to make horizontal shooters, and it's this weird frame skip that happens. It feels like the screen moves one pixel a second. And if you had to contend with only enemies, that would be fine, but this is Gradius. If you've ever played Gradius, then you know Konami loves to put you in really tight situations, be it corridors, large objects that require pinpoint precision to dodge, or debris that you need to shoot to clear your own path. And that's where the MSX version of Gradius falls short. It's the same thing for Parodius and really any early horizontal shooter on the system. Now it's not terrible, it's just a product of its time and comparing this to the arcade entries, it's not entirely fair. They did what they could, but unfortunately for me, it did fall short. I would suggest at least checking it out though, if you're a fan of MSX titles. Juno First is an odd game, and honestly, I don't even know how to describe it. In the arcades, it plays like a really bastardized version of William's Defender, but from a third person perspective, even maintains the same sounds as Defender, but it's stupid, right? It's dumb. Fucking. Dumb! Basically, you have an artificial horizon and you see the enemies coming, then they pop through the horizon and then they're right on top of you and you have to react. You can move forward and left, aft and right, but it just feels like a coin eater. Then we brought the game to the MSX where it is an absolute piece of dog shit. The action and speed of the game, one of the only things that saved it from being rated a D or F, was not capable of being rendered in the slightest. So you get a low-budget, piss-poor attempt at what feels like non-stop space invaders floating from top to bottom with sounds that don't accurately represent the arcade title at all. Frogger on the MSX figured it out. 
more than this one. All right, so Gradius had a strange release history, so I want to play a little bit of catch up for the folks who want to enter the world of Konami's Gradius. The first game was Gradius. It was released in the arcades in 1985, and it features these goons called the Bacterians trying to destroy Gradius, the planet, and you have to defend it. The game was ported to 15 different mediums over time, and it's a badass game. The next game was called Salamander, but for the rest of the world, it was known as Life Force. It was ported to 12 different platforms. Now, what I failed to mention is that Gradius had another name as well, Nemesis, which was the European and computer-based title for the game. So now we have Nemesis 2 on the MSX, which should be Gradius 2, right? No. This is an unrelated, non-canon bullshit sequel that was manifested for the sole purpose of making money on the name. The real Nemesis 2 is Gradius 2, or Vulcan Venture. I know it's confusing, and guess what? It's gonna get more confusing, because on the PC Engine, it was known as Gradius 2 Go For No Yabo! But that's a conversation for another day. Nemesis 2 that I'm talking about right now is only the follow-up of the MSX version of Gradius in 1985. That's it, and guess what? It has the same issues as Gradius, just the horrible playability that is directly affected by the inability of programmers to get the MSX to do what they wanted it to do, at least, you know, at the time. As time went on, programmers would figure out how to make the MSX do magic, but at this point in time, they weren't there yet. I love vertical shooters. I talk about them all the time on the channel because they're just good, clean fun. But you know what isn't fun? Having to juggle bells that are magically loaded in every fucking cloud in front of you while contending with the LSD-driven design aesthetics of Konami. The developers of Twinbee really just looked at a cluttered desk and like, oh yeah, that's an inanimate object. Let's go ahead and add it to the game. So look forward to shooting Q-tips, kitchen knives, ramen bowls, egg beaters, whatever they wanted to put in. I'm surprised there wasn't a big old flying penis. True story. I think I shot a bicycle tire once or twice. It's fucking dreadful. And again, the only way to get bonuses is to juggle these bells that you shoot out of clouds and to shoot them over and over and over again until you get the power up that you want. But don't shoot them too much. Because if you do, it turns into a black bell, and that fucking kills you! I don't like Twin B. Stinger on the NES. That can kick rocks as well. This might look familiar, and you would be right. This is Castlevania 1 on the NES, except it's a little bit different. You see, the MSX struggled with rendering multiple screens in any fashion, be it up or down, or left or right, and the answer was to make everything go screen by screen, so Konami's answer to putting Castlevania on the MSX was Vampire Killer, or Akumajo Dracula. It uses flip screens instead of scrolling, which, to be honest, it didn't bother me as much. What bothered me was the gross departure of what made Castlevania fun. Instead of just making it to the end of the level, we have to find a key which could be hidden anywhere in the stage. All the while, we're going to be dealing with mandatory damage, having to buy quality power-ups from some strange people in white robes, and contending with dreadful controls. I do not have a controller for this. This is what the MSX arrow keys looked like. It isn't fun. At all. Also, you only have three lives, and there are zero opportunities for continues, unless you have the Game Master cartridge, which, guess what? I don't, so I was shit out of luck. After turning to an emulator, it was much more palatable, but still grossly unfun. Konami really hit the ground running when it came to sports games. If they could manifest it, it would be made, be it soccer, baseball, football, and the topic of this game, boxing. Now the first few levels, they're fine. Right? But the game quickly turns into who can push buttons the fastest. It's like a side profile punch out. Except your enemies read your punches like you're whispering them sweetly into their ear. Let's see, how can I describe it better? Hmm. Shittier Rock'em Sock'em Robots. The computer game. It's just a gimmick fest. The boxing games at the time really weren't where they needed to be, so props to Konami for trying, but it didn't age well.
There was a point in time where Konami really wanted to get movie licenses for games. I mean, shit, this was 1987, and LJN was out there scooping up all these movie licenses for that silly console that Nintendo made. So why not scoop up one oddly specific movie, King Kong Lives, and then adapt it into an exceptionally shitty action RPG? We play as Mitchell, or Mitchell Hawk, from the film, who goes to Gold Nebo Island to search for Lady Kong, the only thing capable of saving King Kong, who got fucking gaped on top of the World Trade Center in 1976! Yeah, at the end of uh, 1976's King Kong, he gets shot. He's like straddling the World Trade Centers. It was a different time. Speaking of which, for those who haven't seen King Kong Lives, it's absurd as hell. King Kong was shot, right? We just covered that. And for some weird reason, he needs a heart transplant. And the only other, you know, thing that can give him any chance at living is Lady Kong. And guess what? Spoiler alert! They take too long and King Kong dies. That could have been it, but we needed a video game. One where we fight pigworms, wild boars, and embark on a morbidly boring trial and error fest of walking around hoping you somehow manage to find the right items you need. Even with a walkthrough, I couldn't play this. It was that bad. <laughs> Yeah, buddy, those are some sounds, aren't they? Doesn't that titulate the senses? Don't you feel fulfilled? This is Mopey Ranger, or Mapedanga, I don't know how it's pronounced. Uh, it's a mouse in a maze, that's the best way to say it. It's built as an action game, at least on Moby Games, which is where I, you know, sort of build the library games I'll play while tackling franchises and companies. But by looking at the footage, you can see it's more like a puzzle game. You use these red frowning balls of despair to block off paths from these two angry hearts that run after you. For anyone who cares, they're called Razans. And our whole objective is to rescue our little baby moplets. Now obviously we could logically use the red angry frowning balls of despair to block off paths from the Razans, but more often than not, you're going to block yourself in and then proceed to get fingered by the Razans all the while listening to the sound of a wavering tone constantly gangbanging your eardrum. Again, this is a gimmick game and it really wasn't for me. I didn't enjoy it in the slightest. Why even bother sugarcoating it? it it's a Pac-Man variant, no more no less. And that's it for me. How did you feel about this list? Do you have any experience checking out other MSX titles? I'm always curious to learn about how people perceived this platform, especially in comparison to the other gaming computers at the time. Also, we're about 500 subs away from that 4,000 subscriber milestone, so please consider joining our community of video game enthusiasts that like remembering a time before having to pay bills when life was a little bit easier. Finally, the most important thing you can do for me is to hit that thumbs up button as it directly impacts the visibility of projects that I work on every single day. As always, from my family to your family, good energy, good vibes, fortify her out.